Hello and a very good morning to all of you. Welcome you all today for the Zoom webinar. So make sure to have your mics muted and your cameras turned off to ensure the smooth facilitation of the proceeding. So before we start, let me remind you of a few housekeeping rules. So the webinar link will be available from uh, 9 a.m. till 9.45 uh, p.m. AM. Uh, for everybody to join in and no late attendees will be entertained. So make sure to be present to be uh, present until the end of the webinar to obtain the certificate for the CPD points. And uh, the CPD points are strictly adhered to the NCCPD guidelines. Also, you will instantly receive the certificate once you fill the form. And please be kind enough to use the uh, format of your initials followed by your surname and do not use prefixes like doctor or mister. So all of these are to improve and maintain the standards of the CPD programs conducted by SRI. We thank you for the strict adherence of the CPD regulations and your kind compliance. Also a little bit about asking questions. The question time will be after the webinar. And if you have a question, please type it into the chat function and uh, change the chat settings to all panelists and attendees so that your question can be answered. So today's uh, webinar will be on how to deal with abnormal uterine bleeding in primary care by uh, Dr. Chintaka Banagala, consultant of the obstetrician and gynecologist, senior lecturer and head of the department uh, of uh, obstetrics and gynecology, Sir John Kutulavala Defense University. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Vinura, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, I will uh, start with my presentation straight away. So as you uh, was brief, you can type your questions on the chat box. I will try to answer many uh, questions as possible, uh, given the time frame. Uh, so today, it's uh, when I was asked to deliver this lecture, um, I thought of selecting a topic which will be important for um, most of the uh, participants, so my understanding here is we have uh, maybe medical students and also pre-interns, interns and medical officers who are working in not only obstetrics and gynae but in other fields, maybe in a &E OPDs and also some postgraduate students. So I will try to cater my uh, lecture to, you know, to benefit for all of these categories. Okay, so this is going to be the outline. First, for before understanding abnormal uterine bleeding, we have to have an idea about the physiology of menstruation. That is very important. I will tell you why this is and how to take a complete menstrual history is crucial for diagnosing uh, the uh, different pathologies for abnormal uterine bleeding. Then we will move on to the classification of abnormal uterine bleeding by the uh, International Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecology, FIGO. And then we'll try to understand different courses based on case discussions. Finally, the more important one is the what are the medical options uh, available for uh, management of these in the primary care level. Okay, so the firstly, we need to understand that uh, the physiology of menstrual cycle now, as you, if you can remember, you are a medical student, uh, 
you know physiology lecture so sangaini early lectures it has basically the ovaries ovary ovarian uh, regulation of the menstrual cycle based on the hormonal changes and there are endometrial changes which is happening due to the hormonal uh, changes so initially what happens in the follicular phase is follicles develop into the antral follicle and then into the graafian follicle so during that phase uh, the estrogen level gradually increases in the circulation so that estrogen acts on the endometrium to proliferate the endometrium then what happens uh, at, there's a lh surge which in turn uh, causes ovulation so once the ovulation happens the remaining cells of the graafian follicle change into a structure called the corpus luteum which now switch from estrogen to mainly to the progesterone so the endometrium reacts by increasing the vascularity glandular and become thick and um, you know very congested but after 14 days exactly 14 days after the ovulation this corpus luteum will regress unless there is a pregnancy occurring. So, so what happens after 14 days? So this regress, so the progesterone support declines. So uh, the endometrium uh, sheds off uh, and uh, menstruation happens. So you can see the changes in the endometrium by the ultrasound scan. Initially it is thin during the proliferative phase but at the end of the late prolifer uh, the uh, uh, late proliferative phase there there will be uh, endometrium appearing as a trilamine endometrium and at the secretory phase because it's congested it is more thick and hypercoic homogeneous appearance so there is other basic changes so so why this is important to understand is you know if there is the the first thing is luteal it has to have a luteal phase to get the progesterone in in order to have menstruation that means uh, if there's anovulation there is estrogen activity only on the endometrium so there is going to be proliferation so we call it unopposed estrogen activity causes undue proliferation so if someone is having regular cycles that means she is ovulating if someone is having infrequent cycle, that means they are having basically anovulatory cycles. And they are bleeding is just because the endometrium is too thick and there is no support for the upper layers of the endometrium. So it sheds off. So it's not ovulatory menstrual cycles. So understanding this physiology is very important for you to understand the disease patterns. So now we'll move on to the uh, next aspect in fact this might be the main slide or most important slide so i want you to concentrate on this how to take a proper menstrual history so they will, patients will not come and tell you whether i have regular cycles irregular cycles. they just will, they will just tell that okay i have heavy bleeding but you need to analyze their menstruation properly so two main things one is the cycles other thing is the flow so under cycles the cycle length is important cycle length is duration from the first day of the menstrual cycle to the next uh, next cycle first day so it can be 28 days or can vary not everyone has 28 day cycles variation between 21 to 35 days is considered normal if you're st starting day to the next starting day but if someone is having cycles coming before 21 days then we call them more frequent cycle whereas if it is more than 35 days we call them infrequent cycles we weren't uh, calling this as oligomenaric cycle that is one term that we still use but figo advises in the research purposes to use more terms like infrequent and frequent cycle so you need to assess based on the cycle length whether this is normal frequency infrequent or uh, more frequent cycles then the regularity regularity is uh, 
the shortest cycle variation between the shorter cycles and the longer cycle so if the variation between 20 days it is considered regular cycles but if it is going here and there are more than 20 days it is irregular cycles so then the next thing after assessing the cycles and the regularity is to assess the flow so flow has two parts one is the duration other one is the flow so duration between two to seven days is considered normal and the flow is very sub subjective so one might perceive uh, the heavy bleeding and the other the same bleeding um, might not be considered heavy for the other individual so it is more subjective but if they are feeling it is heavier than before you have to consider it is as a true fact and you had you can ask questions like having uh, passing clots or number of pads being used increase when compared to the past and whether they are using double protection whether they are using extra protection at night but still they floods in the morning and housebound during the period whether they have done an hemoglobin assessment uh, and are, are they anemic likewise so we can ask few questions to you know objectively uh, quantify whether this bleeding is heavy and affecting their quality of life so that is about the menstruation so the complete menstrual history includes these parts as well so ask about age of menarche and last menstrual period so remember it's not last regular menstrual period in everyone but last menstrual period and cycles we discuss about that and also the flow whether it's normal scanty bleeding or heavy bleeding so uh, so you once you assess that you can write it as in the history whether it's shorter cycles 28 days longer cycle 32 days so you can get an idea whether it's regular or not and more normal frequency and the flow in uh, three to five days like this and then after that you have to ask about the associated symptoms like dysmenorrhea there are three symptoms you need to ask dysmenorrhea intermenstrual bleeding and postcoital bleeding so once you get these all seven factors that means you have taken a complete menstrual history and by this itself at least you can come to a diagnosis or narrow down your differential diagnosis most of the time so sometimes if you take a good history sometimes i used to say okay based on your symptoms you most likely to have a problem in the cervix cervical pathology maybe a polyp right and then we just do a scan and there may be a speculum examination to confirm our diagnosis so very important to have a good menstrual history okay so the next part is once we take the menstrual hi history how do we consider our diagnosis so we have a system this is widely used in the world now which is called the palm poem classification so it has basically included almost all the diagnoses as you can have so on the palm side you have the structural problems like polyps adenomyosis leiomyoma or that is called fibroids and malignancies now polyps include cervical polyps as well as endometrial polyps malignancy include uh, cervical and endometrial carcinoma as well as endometrial hyperplasia now remember cervical intraepithelial neoplasia is asymptomatic it does not cause bleeding problems that's why we do pap smears to screen on normal cervix uh, the other side is the coin side which has mainly the non-structural problems so ultrasound scans would be basically normal so they can have coagulopathies um, like bleeding disorders, ITP, uh, von Willebrand disease, even hypothyroidism can cause hypocoagulable state and uh, taking drugs like antiplatelets, uh, clopidogrel, ovoferin, and ovulatory dysfunctions uh, due to mainly due to anovulation. We discuss how this anovulation can cause bleeding problems so may, most of the diseases are related polycystic ovarian syndrome but you can have other diseases as well endometrial is previously known as dysfunctional uterine bleeding this is not this e is not endometrial polyps uh, this is endometrial pathology 
due to the chemical pathological changes in the endometrial environment that is about prostaglandin and all so we will talk about that in much in detail when we go to the treatment with nsaids iatrogenic is uh, uh, you know the contraceptive devices iucd or jadel or uh, dmp related bleeding mostly so these are the causes so once you take your menstrual history you should be able uh, able to based on that history narrow down your uh, differential based on this classification so you don't need to consider all of these differentials but you can narrow down so we'll uh, based on cases we'll try to you know think and try to narrow down your differential diagnosis so i'm going to give you three case scenarios in different age categories now we are not today talking about postmenopausal bleeding we are talking about abnormal uterine bleeding in the reproductive age because postmenopausal bleeding very easy you if a patient tells i have postmenopausal bleeding after one year of stopping the menstru last menstrual period then immediately we refer them to the tertiary care for ultrasound scan and assessment of the endometrium so that is within two weeks you have to do so end of discussion that so there is nothing uh, major to discuss in term of working the uh, differential diagnosis but here it's about the reproductive age group uh, before menopause so you have first case think about this 16 year old girl school girl presenting with the mother and telling that she's having heavy bleeding during her menstruation and which it lasts about 10 to 12 days okay so what would you, what are you going to ask they would just tell that the side she's bleeding uh, uh, more days like 10 days 12 days with heavy bleeding right that is the because that is their problem they are they are, they will not willingly tell that okay i have uh, this my cycles are irregular or not right so you need to hard uh, ask uh, for the symptoms so what are you going to ask okay so we have asked from her what is the age of menarche right so it was 12 years and she had regular cycles up to one year after menarche where after that she developed cycles so we initially asked, asked about the cycles so cycles are being irregular infrequent right so menstruating only in every two to three months and once she bleeding she has heavy bleeding and passes clots but there is no associated dysmenorrhea or intermenstrual bleeding and the last menstrual period was four months back so by this you have taken a complete menstrual history now straight away you can tell okay she's having infrequent cycle so there's a problem with ovulation only if they have problem with ovulation they can have infrequent cycles so then you think okay what are my differential diagnosis for anovulatory cycles and you direct your questions based on that one of the thing is polycystic ovaries so you ask about weight gain acne hirsutism hyperandrogenic features and also hypothyroidism features and past medical history past surgical history is unremarkable so in this kind of a young girl this if they are having infrequent cycles you can say okay the polyps adenomyosis lyomyoma are unlikely and malignancy and hyperplasia also unlikely in this group so this palm side which has the structural problems are very unlikely but this side ovulated dysfunction is the commonest cause right and if they are coming with heavy regular bleeding then they can might have endometrial problems which is the regulation of the prostaglandin synthesis is uh, disturb or they can have coagulopathy like itp or von willebrand disease if they have heavy menstrual bleeding but regular so coagulopathy presenting uh, as heavy menstrual bleeding will be from the menarche so straight away from the menarche when she start bleeding she, they will have heavy bleeding but in this patient as you can see the differential diagnosis narrows down to ovulatory dysfunction so it's very easy to manage your patient 
So you, you know that your differentials for ovulatory dysfunctions would be polycystic ovarian syndrome. Now she is more likely because she has acne, hirsutism and weight gain. But you need to ask questions about hyperprolactinemia like galactoria, headache, visual disturbances. And also consider Cushing's. They also will have infrequent cycles plus obesity and hyperandrogenism features. But you have to examine for Cushing features. And late onset adrenal hyperplasia also can present with uh, anovulated cycles plus hyperandrogenic features. So if you are having a doubt about the diagnosis, then we can do the endocrinological investigations like FSH, LH. So in polycystic patempsin, the LH is high compared to the FSH and also serum testosterone level can be high. In other hyperandrogenic causes, testosterone level can be uh, significantly higher. Prolactin can be done if there are symptoms and ultrasound scan also can be requested. So based on that, you can have a diagnosis. So what are I going to do for this girl, 16-year-old girl having anovulatory cycles? So now we, based on the history uh, and the blood investigations, we can diagnose polycystic ovary syndrome even without ultrasound scan. You know the Rotterdam criteria, I have not included it here. If you have two out of three criteria, and if you have considerably uh, excluded other causes, uh, endocrinological causes, you can do a diagnosis of polycystic. So what are the treatment? Treatment can be general. Uh, you know, polycystic ovaries is something that cannot be completely cured, but it can be controlled because it's genetically determined multifactorial disease. So whenever there is weight increase, the symptoms will appear like oligomenonic cycles and hyperandrogenic features. So weight reduction is the is very important for you to them to control the symptoms uh, in a long term basis. And also they are more prone for diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. So lifestyle modification, exercise, diet controls are important, and also. Uh, screen for glucose intolerance, especially if they have acanthosis nigricans, that is a feature of insulin resistance. What are the specific treatment? OCP can be given, uh, especially if they are more than 16 years. If you start OCP before 16 years, the epiphyseal plates can get fixed uh, due to the exogenous estrogen. So the unless they have uh, attain their maximum uh, you know growth potential or the height potential we generally tend not to start uh, ocp that is before 16 years but even if you give ocp uh, for six months i always tell them we are giving this as a temporary measure until you get your weight down so because after that if your weight is still the same the once you stop the ocp the cycles are going to be the same so weight reduction is the most critical thing. And you can give metformin that will improve the ovulation as well as help them to uh, get the weight down. They can have fatty liver also if they are obese. Okay, so that is about the first case. So you, you know how to deal with bleeding in the uh, early, uh, you know, young girls. So the second one, is uh, second case you have a much older lady in the reproductive age 38 year old woman presenting with heavy menstrual bleeding for two years duration so what are you going to ask still the same we are going to ask about the menstrual detailed menstrual history so what she's telling is she's having cycles now they are regular 30 to 35 days so just shorter cycle 30 days 35 days longer cycle so they are regular but the flow is heavy. Why it is heavy? She plasters clots and housebound and increased number of pads during the years. And she has some anemic symptoms. And we have asked about the associated symptoms. She complains of dysmenorrhea, but there is no intermenstrual bleeding or postcoital bleeding. And the last menstrual period is few days back. So this during this age group, in this age group, it's very important to ask about the contraceptive because contraceptive also can lead to abnormal bleeding. So, but she is not using any contraceptives. She delivered babies by cesarean sections to children, and there are no features of suggestive of hypothyroidism. So now, with this history in mind, 
what are the possible differential based on the palm coin classification? She has regular hemisphere BD, that means she is ovulating. So there is unlikely to be ovulatory dysfunction. Right? So it's mostly this area, structural problems, where they can have polyps, adenomyosis, or leiomyoma, so fibroids. And also, it can be endometrial or iatrogenic. But we have asked whether they, she is using any contraceptive. She is not telling, but you have to ask that. Endometrial means heavy menstrual bleeding without any uh, cause to be found on the ultrasound scan. And it can be coagulopathy as well. Uh, unlikely to have you know late onset coagulopathies, but hypothyroidism can cause uh, coagulation problems. So they can come with bleeding. So these are the differentials that you need to think of. Okay, so with this in mind, you need to examine the patient. Okay, I need to exclude polyps, especially cervical polyps, and also uh, adenomyosis and fibroids. So you need to do a proper pelvic examination uh, to uh, diagnose. So these are the diagnoses. And uh, so the assessment wise, you can do hemoglobin level and we can do a thyroid function because there is subclinical hypothyroidism is associated and abdominal examination as well as pelvic examination is very important. So master your pelvic examination, even in the primary care, if you are no OPD, ANE, uh, or in your general practice, you can do abdominal as well as pelvic examination, just have a normal disposable gloves and uh, so if you can feel the uterus that means it's enlarged if you feel the uterus above the symphysis pubis that is it is more than 12 weeks size uh, and if it is tender it's more likely to be adenomyotic uterus uh, fibroids tend to be a bit firm uh, like mostly non-tender however if there's degeneration you can have tender fibroids as well so do a pelvic examination. Speculum examination is very important, especially if they have irregular bleeding because the cervix bleeds without control of the menstrual cycle. So uh, speculum examination is important because I have seen a lot of patients being treated for irregular bleeding with maybe norethistrone or mephonemic tranexamic acid without putting a speculum. And once they are not responding to that for six months, they come and ask from asking the symptoms if they have postcoital bleeding, intermenstrual bleeding, or irregular bleeding, then it indicates okay, there can be a, some structural problems. So straight away, when we put the speculum, there can be a polyp. There, there's a polyp. So just a polypectomy would be enough. And you cannot miss. Uh, and late diagnosis of an invasive cervical cancer because early stage we can cure the disease by a wartime hysterectomy. So if they have irregular bleeding, make sure that you put a speculum and exclude any cervical pathologies. Okay, the final case is about uh, a much uh, close to menopause. We call this the perimenopausal age group. So she's 48 years and complaining of heavy bleeding for three months. So what is the history? Again, menstrual history is going to be the same. So we are asking about the cycles first. She is telling cycles are irregular. We ask why are you telling it's irregular? Because it's more frequent. She is bleeding every 15 to 20 days. Is that normal in this age group? No, it's not normal because this age group, the normal physiology is to have anovulatory cycles. Uh, now, when they have anovulation, because uh, close to menopause, they sometimes skip the ovulation. So they can have infrequent cycles and bleeding a uh, bit heavily because the endometrium become thick. But if they have more frequent cycle, it's not physiological for this age group. So definitely we need to investigate. And when we ask about the flow, she's telling it's occasionally heavy and passes clots and sometimes continue bleeding for it, up to 15 days. So she has an abnormal flow also. Associated symptoms, anemic symptoms she has. 
uh, and dysmenorrhea, intermenstrual bleeding, postcoital bleeding. So she doesn't have dysmenorrhea uh, associated with this. So into the gynae history, she is a nulliparous. So she is not using any contraceptives and pap smear has been not done. And she is not on any anticoagulants and the past medical history and surgical history. Surgical history is unremarkable, but she has diabetes and hypertension. So we can identify some risk factors for endometrial problems as well. So with that in the history, now we are thinking, okay, what is the possible diagnosis? Now she is having uh, more frequent cycles, right? So more frequent cycles either can be due to if she's ovulating quickly or if she's having something, some structure bleeding irrespective of the ovulation and having more frequent ovulation is very uncommon. So most likely she is having a structure which is bleeding uh, without the control of the hormonal menstrual cycle. So we need to consider polyps because polyps, especially cervical polyps, can bleed uh, when they expose to the uh, vaginal acidic environment with the microorganisms. And they can have post bleeding also. Even endometrial polyps can bleed without the menstrual cycles. So that need to be considered. And malignancy and hyperplasia is high on the list because she's 48 years nulliparous. And whether she has an endometrial or cervical cancer is or hyperplasia is common. So what is the management plan? Now this patient, it is not wise to start uh, her own any medical therapy before we exclude uh, uh, a malignancy. So infrequent bleeding can be physiological in this age group, but if they have more frequent bleeding, suspect a structural lesion. So we need to do a speculum examination. And whenever you put a speculum, if the cervix is normal, ask whether they have had the pap smears 35 years and 45 years is the recommendation for Sri Lanka. So if they hasn't had pap smears, you can do a opportunistic pap smear screening if you are in a MOH or in your hospital, uh, given she is not bleeding at this point. And always try to refer for ultrasound scan to exclude any endometrial pathologies. The treatment would be course specific. So once she is referred, how do we decide whether she needs endometrial assessment? If someone is bleeding irregularly in more than 45 years, generally we tend to do a biopsy because hyperplasia risk is there. And also heavy menstrual bleeding, even if it is regular, more than 45 years and if not responding to medical treatment. And if there are risk factors like obesity and uh, polycystic ovaries, which risk factors for hyperplasia, then we tend to do a biopsy in the first place. And if there are ultrasound findings, like, like in the la second picture, it's suggestive of endometrial pathology, you can see hyperplasia and increased vascularity, there are cystic spaces, or if there's focal lesions in the endometrium, we can do biopsy either by hysteroscopy biopsy or pupil aspiration or even a simple dilatation and curettage. So what I want you to understand in this age group, Remember to exclude the structural diseases, which is mainly malignancy. Now, about the contraceptive-related abnormality trend bleeding can be due to JADEL or DMP, even uh, IUCD. Now, JADEL and DMPA is uh, mainly due to the high yeast progesterone level acting on the endometrium. Endometrium become atrophic and thin, so the support to the vascular layer underlying the endometrium is less. So these tiny vessels can rupture and bleed. So they will bleed irregularly and continuously, not heavy, but it's scanty bleeding. Rarely they can have heavy bleeding, but it's basically due to the uh, action of the progesterone. So do you think giving progesterone or norethestone in this case will help? No, it will further aggravate the problem. So what we need to do is do to try to regenerate the endometrium by giving a trial of OCP. So that will, uh, estrogen will act on the endometrium and proliferate and the bleeding will stop. You can try for one month with the OCP, but if not, uh, then need to refer for the uh, secondary care. So 
this is the last slide of, of the courses before going into the uh, drugs management. So remember, regularity of the cycle is the most important thing for you to differ, um, you know, uh, differentiate the diagnosis. So regular menstrual bleeding is most likely due to fibroids, adenomyosis, polyps, bleeding disorders, or coagulopathy, hypothyroidism, endometrial, dysfunctional uterine bleeding. We previously called dysfunctional. Now we know it's prostaglandin related. And IUCD also can have regular menstrual bleeding or irregular also. So irregular bleeding is mainly due to the anovulate cycles if they are infrequent cycles. But if they have more frequent cycles, then think of sinister pathologies, endometrial or cervical polyps, hyperplasia, endometrial, endometrial carcinoma, cervical carcinoma. PID, due to endometritis, they can bleed irregularly and iatrogenic causes like contraceptives. So based on the history itself, just by asking whether it's a regular, irregular, more frequent, less frequent, you can have a, your differential diagnosis narrowed down. Okay. So the final few slides on the treatment option you can use. You Basically, you are using medical treatment in the primary care. So non-hormone like NSAID or tranexamic acid can be used or hormonal treatment, norethestone or combined oral contraceptive pills. The rest of the medical treatment are usually reserved for the secondary and the tertiary care as well as the surgery. So we're going to talk about these four options in details. So you know the pathway of prostaglandin synthesis by membrane phospholipid convert to arachidonic acid and then cyclooxygenase enzyme convert them into prostaglandin. So there are four main prostaglandins important for the endometrial regulation of menstruation. Prostaglandin I2 or prostacycline, thromboxane A2, PGE2 and PGF2 alpha. So these different prostaglandin act differently on the endometrium. So they are balanced. Uh, determine whether you are bleeding normally or heavily uh, and also about the pain. So changes in the prostaglandin levels has been noticed in patients having heavy menstrual bleeding and dysmenorrhea. Uh, so bleeding can be increased if the prostaglandin E2 and the I2 which are basically the vasodilators uh, are if their contents are increased. So that is the part we talked previously as uh, named as dysfunctional uterine bleeding. Uh, pain also can be increased. The pain fibers nociceptors can be stimulated by prostaglandin as well as prostaglandin can cause uterine contractility and cause this cramping pain, especially the PGF2 alpha. So it, the changes in the relative levels can uh, give these problems. So NSAIDs which block the uh, cyclooxygenase pathway uh, like mefenamic uh, and ibuprofen and naproxen can significantly reduce the bleeding as well as pain uh, by uh, you know reducing the endometrial prostaglandin and also direct uh, pain uh, analgesic action on the central nervous system. So how do we give this? Indications are don't give mephenomic, tranexamic, mephenomic acid, tranexamic acid for irregular bleeding because we haven't addressed the pathology in the irregular bleeding. Regular menstrual bleeding, you can give mephenomic, tranexamic because even if you give it to adenomyosis or fibroids, it will control the symptoms. There is uh, no much uh, you know, uh, harm for the patient. Uh, even if you di lately diagnose the fibroids or adenomyosis, right? But if it is irregular without diagnosing, don't give mephenomic tranexamic. So you can give this for regular hair menstrual bleeding and also primary or secondary dysmenorrhea mephenomic acid can be given. So use only during the menstruation, three to five days, contraindicated in underlying bleeding disorders because they are uh, having problems with the plate, making the platelet plug. But the main side effects is GI side effects. So warn the patient and you can give some thing like famotidine or omeprazole along with that. Then the second drug is the tranexamic acid. So 
in the fibrinolysis pathway, so once the fibrin clot is formed, plasminogen is activated in into plasmin, and this plasmin act on the fibrin clot and uh, causes degradation of this fibrin plug. So plasminogen activation to plasmin needs a molecule called lysine. There's a lysine binding site on the plasminogen. So tranexamic acid is a synthetic derivative of lysine. So it binds to plasminogen, but prevents activation of plasminogen into plasmin. So the fibrin clot stabilizes. So there is no lysis. So this is antifibrinolytic agent. So it also has a good effect, uh, better, better effect than uh, NSAID on controlling hemenstrual bleeding. But the main side effect is the GI side effects. Now, because this is uh, causes more thrombosis, uh, the clot remains same. So active thromboembolic disease is a contraindication. So uh, arterial or venous thrombosis, even myocardial infarction patients or stroke patients, history of stroke, we don't use tranexamic acid or severe renal failure or hypersensitivity to tranexamic acid are contraindications. And COCP, again, a drug which is commonly used to treat heavy menstrual bleeding, uh, combine it with tranexamic acid can increase the thrombosis risk because estrogen also increase the thrombosis risk. So remember that, don't combine these two together. Okay, so the third drug is commonly used in the primary care is nortistrol. Now, as I said before, don't use any medical op treatment option if they are having irregular, more frequent bleeding, right? So, but if you are using this for uh, to control bleeding, can be given five milligram TDS for twenty one days, five to twenty six. This is the commonest regime, and it is quite effective. But patient satisfaction is less can be less because of the side effects. So we use this as a bridging therapy until the permanent treatment is coming through. But as I said before, do not start without excluding malignancy, especially more than 40 years. Breakthrough bleeding during the nortestone treatment need to be investigated. So they need to go for biopsy. Can have adverse effects on his surgical interpretations. If we start nortistone early and if you go for a pipel biopsy or a DNC biopsy, the histology will can alter because there can be changes uh, uh, in the glandular structure. So the interpretation is difficult for the pathologist. So if you suspect their structural disease, go for the biopsy and then start the nortistone. So the final drug we use is the Combined pills. Combined pills are fantastic because it will reduce the you know blood loss by about fifty percent. But there are additional benefits: contraceptive effect, it regularizes the bleeding, reduce pain, and also anti-androgenic effect based on the progesterone component. So the commonest used one is the cheapest available in the market is the Mithuri, which has levonorgestrel as a progesterone component. It is a second generation progesterone, uh, but it can have some side effects be because of the this levonorgestrel. But newer ones like drosperinone containing ones are having less side effects because they are uh, having uh, anti mineral corticoid activity, so the water retention is less. And if there are androgenic side effects, uh, androgenic effect like acne hirsutism, adding ciproterone as the progesterone component will. Uh, increase uh, the, the help with you with the controlling these hypergenic effects. So selecting the correct OCP will be based on the cost and the, uh, you know, the age as well as the symptoms the patient is having. But there are contraindications for COCP. Remember this, this increases, COCP increases the thromboembolic Disease. So any risk factors, BMI more than 35, smokers, uh, women with hypertension. Now, whatever the control of hypertension, if you put it into the UK make criteria, eligibility criteria, it will be three or four. So don't use this with patients with hypertension. 
Vascular disease means like SLE, APLS, those kind of autoimmune diseases. And migraine with aura, always before giving this uh, OCP, ask. Because if, if, you, if you start, there's an increased risk of uh, stroke. And current or recent breast cancer, personal or family history of venous thrombomelism, known thrombogenic mutation, and also postpartum less than six months because it will reduce the quantity as well as the quality of the breast milk production. But uh, there's a myth that, you know, OCP cannot be used after 40 years, something like that. But if you don't, if the patient doesn't have these uh, risk factors, then actually you can continue OCP until the menopause, uh, even if they are desired, right? Okay, so uh, I just put this slide down the last moment because this is very useful. Uh, this is about, you can have this on your, uh, mobile application as a mobile application WHO contraception uh, app I'm sure most of you the GPS and everyone will have it but uh, so you can select uh, what are the risk factors the patient has so I've selected here elevated blood pressure levels uh, properly taken treatment systolic blood pressure less than 160 and diastole less than 100 so if you select that you will get the at the end what is the UK make criteria? So you can see CO uh, combined pills is category three. That means it's uh, not suitable to use. And if you click this vascular disease, uh, this is systolic pressure is uh, more than 160, it will become four. So it's very easy. If you're not sure, you can check it because you cannot remember all the UK make criteria by heart. So useful app to have. Okay, so we have come to the end of the presentation so uh, i want to highlight proper menstrual history can narrow down your differential diagnosis quite significantly and think about possible causes based on the aub classification by the figure it is useful if you you know do it practice it few times uh, then it will become very easy to you know think about the di diagnosis and perform and master the pelvic examination technique speculum examination very important i cannot stress enough about this i have seen a lot of patients being mismanaged and full blood count endocrinological assessment if you think there is endocrinological problems based on the history and the pattern of bleeding pattern you can do even the clotting studies and uh, mephenomic acid, tranexamic acid, northeastone, COCP can be used safely in the primary level given that you have excluded the sinister pathologies. If more frequent bleeding likely to have sinister, more than 45 years need to consider excluding malignancy. And if you suspect based on the history or the examination like a large uterus, please exclude, uh, please refer for the ultrasound scan. So that is the end of the presentation. Uh, the QA session, I have a few questions. Okay, so first they asked, uh, in the first case, that means the girl with, uh, you know, oligomenorrhic cycles with uh, hyperandrogenic features, her cytosome and acne, uh, can we use uh, aldosterone agonist, antagonist, it's like spinalactone for her, her cytosome? Now, it's not the first line. I wouldn't straight away start because if you have a condition to start high, uh, that kind of a hyperandrogenism, probably you might be thinking, referring this patient to a dermatologist or an endocrinologist uh, to start that kind of a treatment. But uh, starting simple uh, OCP like containing ciproterone would be helpful. But remember to advise them, uh, they need to continue minimum six to nine months to see an effect on the hirsutism because hair follicle cycle is six to nine months. So it will not uh, get the existing hair follicles uh, to uh, go away, but it is 
the hair follicles, the new newly generating hair follicles will be less. So they need to continue to six months to see the effect. Uh, yes, so stress effect on menstruation, uh, it uh, will decrease the frequency because uh, GnRH axis is suppressed, so annovulation, so infrequent cycles. Uh, so is there any relationship with body weight change and the regularity? Yes, of course, because uh, adipose tissue, peripheral adipose tissue convert uh, estrogen um, the, has, uh, you know, they produce estrogen by aromatization. Uh, so estrogen will act on the uh, hypothalamus and reduce the FSH. So follicular maturation is less. So if you are, if someone is obese, they can have infrequent cycle because of the excessive estrogen effect. Uh, eligibility criteria we are using, you can make, yes. So I gave the app. Uh, when a patient wants to delay menses for a few days, usually prescribe northeastone. How many days before the menstruation, northeastone? Uh, there is no research evidence for that, but I usually, in my experience, if you start at least three or two days before the menstruation, usually it works. So you uh, even, I mean, if she's not bleeding at the moment, you can start and see. Advisable drug to delay the menstruation. I depends on the situation. You can use OCP or Northeastone. How long many cycles we can continue Northeastone for? Uh, 40. How long? So first you need to uh, exclude the malignancy, endometrial hyplasia, endometrial CA and cervical CA. Once you are reliably excluded, you can even continue this up to 50 years. I mean, until they are menopause. But uh, they have side effects. So most of the patient doesn't like to continue. So we might have to go for other treatment options like intrauterine devices like uh, Mirena or uh, Leonogestrel intrauterine system, which can keep there for five years. Uh, yes. Sir, sir. Uh, there were some other questions uh, that were sent in the uh, questionnaire as well. Uh, so one was as general practitioners, when do we have to refer the patients to specialists? So I I, mean, I discussed that. So if if there is irregular cycles, especially more frequent bleeding. Uh, in more than 40 years, you need to refer. If you put a speculum, if you see any abnormality, you have to refer. If the pelvic examination shows it's an enlarged uterus, then you need to refer. But otherwise, you can try a few cycles with the medical management given. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, right. And Again, not start. Uh, please explain again the reason we should not start OCP under the 16 years. So that is because they are still in the growth spurt. So, you know, estrogen act on the epiphyseal plates and causes them to fuse. So after that, once the fusion happens, there is no uh, growth spurt. Uh, the height will, you know, stop at this point. So unless they have, you know, some will have finished their growth spurt by 15, but and if you're not sure, better not to start OCP. So there's another one in the chapter. Can IUCDs cause lower abdominal pain? If so, what are the options available? So initial period, immediately after the first three months, they can have abdominal pain because there's uh, still adaptation of the uterus for this uh, foreign body. So you can give mephanamic acid uh, or if they are bleeding, but unless simple analgesic can be given, but need to exclude PID because abdominal pain is a feature of PID, ask for PV discharge and feel the uh, abdomen, whether there is adenexial tenderness uh, and whether they have low-grade fever symptoms like that. And then you can try a uh, course of antibiotics uh, either doxycycline, metronidazole or coamoxiclav, even acetromycin, uh, try and see whether the is, it will settle. But unless if it not settles, then uh, might have to remove it. Uh, I think that's it for the question. 
So today, sir. So, uh, so because it's at uh, end, uh, so I would like to thank uh, Sri Organization Society for Health Research and Innovations for inviting me to present for you all, and also uh, uh, Dr. Thanigi Vasan, who's my batchmate, uh, for inviting for me for the session and Miss Manasi for doing the logistics. And not finally, but my teachers, you know, uh, I have to thank Dr. Madhu Karanath, who's one of my teachers. Uh, you know, I got most of this knowledge and the practice because I've seen even he's a busy clinician. He used to put a speculum whenever he detect if there's a problem in the cervix. And so uh, having this kind of uh, knowledge and experience is very important and for us to uh, you know, transmit this knowledge to the future generation. So I thank everyone for listening and for asking questions. Thank you.